Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. That's right, Father. It's Jesus, you alone. It's you alone that we come to this building today as a body of believers to realign our hearts with you and our minds with you. We want to look more like you, Jesus, and live more like you. So thank you that you've given us breath this morning to sing your praises. We give this entire time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, you are sent to class, and it's time for our favorite time, the awkward greeting. Turn to a neighbor and say hello. Good morning. Welcome to Delmody Community Church. My name is Becca Eldon. I'm one of the staff members here, and we are so thrilled that you chose to worship with us this morning. I have a couple of things that we would just like for you to know, um, and then we'll move into our time of message and teaching. Uh, first, if you are new to us, if we haven't reached out over email to you, there is this orange connect card in the seat backs in front of you. Um, we would love to know that you're here and have a, connect a connection point with you so that if you have any questions, prayer requests, all those things, you have someone to reach out to. It also puts you on our list to invite to one of our favorite events called Lunch with the Pastors. It's a time where we gather those that have been attending for a little bit uh, that are newer, and we come together and we have lunch at um, our teaching pastor Jeff's house, and we get to know one another Another, share a little bit about the church and it's always such a joyful time and we get to learn about each other and we love it and so if you would like to be invited to that um, please uh, fill out th this card so that we know to invite you to that 
Um, and then also, we just wanted to say how excited we are about last weekend. It was such a lovely Easter weekend bet between the um, Good Friday service that I think the band did like 20 songs because it was a worship night and they led us uh, for a really lovely long worship service to um, our packed out uh, Easter service. Um, we just loved celebrating the resurrection of Jesus with all of you, and we're so grateful that you invited your friends and family. Uh, we loved um, having everyone here, and we also are so thankful for all that helped from greeters to, uh, there was a bunch of guys that came on Saturday and set up all these chairs, and there was just so many people who helped um, make that happen. So thank you, and um, we're so excited about um, all that God did that weekend. And then finally, I'm gonna call up one of our elders, Bob Hart, to pray over our service. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we, uh, we are grateful to be here in, uh, in this assembly with one another as your children. And Father, we pray and ask that you would use Jeff, that you would speak to us by his preparation and through his words that you would quicken to our hearts the things that, that Father, you want us to, to learn and to walk in so that we are built up in Christ Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you help us each one to attain to the full measure of the man in Jesus that you intend for us to be and, and to grow in our love for one another. Uh, bless Jeff's discussion and, and his message, and I pray, Father, that you would, that you would give us understanding in his name. Amen. We're going to start a new sermon series this week on taxes because you know now you all know what they say right for a christian there's only three certainties in life death resurrection and taxes so we're going to talk a little about your taxes because taxes actually for a christian your taxes actually are super super helpful do you know how everyone tells you you ought to get a physical every year Right, you ought to go see the doctor, you ought to let him take your blood, you ought to let him look you over, because the reality is that there's all sorts of things that go on in our bodies that we're not aware of. And so it is super helpful to go, get tested out, run everything that needs to be run, to find out if there's any issues. Right? Your taxes are kind of like that for you. They're kind of like an, an annual physical for your finances. Because they force you to confront some things you don't necessarily want to confront, right? Like, I hate going to the doctor. They're just going to tell me things I don't want to know. Your taxes force you to confront things you don't want to confront. They, they force you to see things maybe you didn't want to see. They, they fill out stuff. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but when Elizabeth and I were first married, we followed all the first married advice, and we kept a, a, a journal of, you know, this is the money we're spending, right? We, we wrote down all our expenses, and we did that for like a month, and it was so terrifying we've never done it sense because you find out all these things about how you spend money like I don't want to know that about myself I don't want to know that I spend this much money on this or that I'm doing these things you know your taxes force you to confront that and when you've done them which I hope you have because you know they're due really really soon when you've done your taxes you have a listing of all of your income which is to say all the ways that God has provided for you you have a listing of all the ways that God has taken care of you because he promises that. He promises you that he will take care of your needs. Right? And needs in the Bible, Jesus says, is what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to sleep. Those are your needs. That's what Jesus says. He says, look, if you worry about my kingdom, I'll take care of your needs. I'll take care of where you sleep, what you eat, what you wear. Paul will tell Timothy, and this is, you know, decades after Jesus. He's like, look, if we have food and clothing, then we should be content. Now, if you are sitting here right now listening to me, or, or maybe you're watching this on a film at some point, right? I am willing to bet that when you finished your taxes, you had more than just clothes and shelter and food. I mean, maybe not. There's a lot of people in the world that that's what they have at the end of every year. That's all they got. They, they ate, they clothed themselves, they slept somewhere. That is the sum total of their economy. 
But I don't think there's any spoilers in saying if you're sitting here with me in North Atlanta or you're watching this, probably when you finished your taxes, you discovered that God had provided way, way more than just food and clothing and shelter. He probably provided for you abundantly. God was probably incredibly generous to you this year. And your taxes show you that. Like you see it in black and white. You see God's generosity and his provision for you. And you know how you responded to that. Because our tax code makes, has benefits for you if you're generous. If you are generous, you are allowed to deduct that from your taxes. Our tax code has benefits in it for generosity, which for us as Christians, wow, that's great <clears throat> because our faith expects us to be generous. We are expected to be people who are generous, just like our taxes are showing us everything that's coming in in the course of a year. Wow, they're also showing us everything that's going out, aren't they? They're showing us all our expenses, all the things we had to pay for, and they're showing us all the things that we didn't have to. We chose to. We chose to be generous. I want to read you something that the Apostle Paul says. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And it's so, 1 Corinthians, we did it once many years ago. It's, it's all these different questions they're asking him. They ask him a question about giving. And this is his response to them. It's 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, ch- chapter 16. It says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So this is Paul's normal advice to churches, to Christians. Like, how should you be generous? How should you be giving money to God's people for God's work? He says, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. That's what the Apostle Paul tells churches. This is how you should take care of God's people. This is how you should be generous. This is what God expects from us. You should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Folks, this is the one time of year when you know your income. Like you've done it. You've done all the calculations. You know everything that came in and you know everything that went out. You know how God has been good to you. You know how God has been generous. If you're gonna help, with other things, if you're gonna be kind and generous to other people, and Paul says, well, you know, you should do that in keeping with what God's given to you, not what he hasn't given to you. I mean, you know, he doesn't say everybody give a cow. I don't care what your income was, everybody give the same thing, right? He says, look, what was your income? How has God blessed you? What's come in for you? Take a portion of that and set aside you right now. This is the time of year, every year, that you can answer that question. What was your income? How much came in? So you know when you go to the doctor and they take your blood and they run the tests and your doc comes back and he says super helpful things to you like, well, you know, your triglycerides are 1.7 and your white blood cells are 300. And you're like, what does that mean? (laughs) What do I do with those numbers? He has to explain what do these numbers matter? What what are good numbers? What are bad numbers? We're going to take the next couple weeks and look at some passages of scripture that talk to us about, okay, what does it mean for us to be generous? What should it look like? If God's been generous to me and he expects me to be generous to other people, great, my triglycerides are 1.7. Is that really good? Is that really bad? Am I in a lot of trouble? Is this exciting? We're going to look at some passages of Scripture to kind of help us work through, okay, I, I've taken my financial physical. What do I do with these numbers? So turn in your Bibles. Finally, we've gotten to the turn in your Bibles part. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. So you don't know where it is, go to like, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John kind of thing. Go to Matthew and flip back a page. We're going to be in Malachi chapter three. Malachi is kind of a fun book. He's a prophet, but normally prophets are speaking for themselves. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah's talking. In, in Isaiah, Isaiah's talking. In Malachi, Malachi himself never talks. He just records these conversations between God and the people. And so we get to hear what God thinks, which is true in most prophets, but we also get to hear what the people think. We get to hear what they say back to God, which is kind of fun. So we're going to pick up on one of these conversations that God and the people are having, interestingly enough, about generosity. So I'm going to start in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, and I'm going to read on through to the end of chapter 3. So read along with me. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. 
Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from me, away from my decrees and not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you do rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I don't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You've spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You've said it's futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. Even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who fear the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possessions. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Okay, little context here. Do you remember just a few weeks ago, we were doing this series in Lent on redemption, the history of redemption. How after the fall, Adam and Eve and God, they're all together in the garden and then they won't obey him. So they can't stay, it all falls apart. We have these various things that God does to try and bring people back together. And we're always asking ourselves, oh, is this it? Abraham, is this this? Is this gonna bring God back together? No. And the next one was Moses and the tabernacle. God, you know, they go, they go to Mount Sinai. They camp there for like a year. Moses goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down the mountain. And he brings back all these instructions from God. And he brings back this long set of instructions to build this tent called the tabernacle, which is going to be God's house. God is going to live. It's going to be his throne room. He's going to be right there. Finally, God and people for thousands and thousands of years has been separated. Now, finally, God and people, at least they're going to dwell kind of together from now on. Thank you. God is going to be here in this tent. The people can't come into his room. They can't come into his throne room, but they can at least get close. Do you remember all the rules we talked about? Everything that happened in the tabernacle. So now you've got this tent. There's all these sacrifices that have to be made. If you remember, we talked about Aaron, Moses' brother. He's going to come before God for the people. And to do that, he's got to take a special bath. And he's got to put on special underwear. And then he's got to wear special clothes. And then he's got to wear special jewelry over the special clothes, over the special underwear, after he's had the special bath. There's so much that has to happen for God and people to be anywhere near each other anymore. And so God takes a whole group of Israelites. They're called the Levites because all of them trace their father's 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 father back up to a guy named Levi. Remember, Israel gets its name from a man named Israel. They're all descendants of this one guy. It's like five or 600 years before the time of Moses. This one guy, Israel. Israel had 12 sons. And so this nation is divided up by, okay, which one of these 12 sons, who, which one of those is your ancestor? God takes one of those groups, this is a 12th of the nation, the Levites, the people who trace their fathers back up to the guy Levi, and he makes them in charge of the tabernacle. Like, they're the ones who have to take care of it. They're the ones who have to move it. They got to pack it up. They got to put it back down. They got to inspect it. They have to do all the sacrifices, all the offerings. He takes a 12th of the country, and he takes them out of the economy, because now they're not farmers and they're not shepherds, and they're not blacksmiths, and they're not cobblers, and they're not coopers, and they don't make anything. They don't produce anything. They don't grow anything. They take care of this giant tent, which is God's house, and they minister for people. They stand between people and God. You can't come to God and offer your own animal and sacrifice, because if you remember what happens to Aaron's sons when they mess around with that, You can't just show up in God's presence. There's still this huge distance between God and people. You have to come to the Levites. The Levites kill the animal. They take it to the priest. The priest takes it into the holy place. There's all these things that have to happen. So these guys aren't 
producing any food. So how are they going to eat? They don't get paid. When you bring an animal to the Levite, you don't got to slip him a 20 to get him to do the sacrifices. That's what he does. How are they going to eat? So God provided two things. First thing he provided was offerings. You are required to bring animals to the temple, or the tabernacle in this case. Later, Solomon will build an actual building, but it's, it's the same as the tent. It's just got solid walls now. You have to bring animals all the time. You have to bring offerings. When I bring that offering, let's say you're the Levite and I have to bring the offering and I bring it to you and it's a, it's a lamb. You take the lamb, you kill it, you take out its guts, take out its intestines, you burn the intestines up on the altar. The lamb goes back to the kitchen because that's dinner for the Levites. Every morning you have to put out a dozen loaves of bread. There's just a table in this tent. You put out a dozen loaves of bread before God and every evening you take the loaves and you go back and you take them to the dining room and the Levites eat them. That's one of the ways the Levites eat. You are required to bring animals and food and you don't give it to God. You don't burn it up in God's presence. The Levites eat it. And the other thing God comes up with, the other thing he institutes is called the tithe. Tithe means a tenth, one out of 10. You are required, whatever you do for a living, farmer, shepherd, blacksmith, whatever it is, you are required to bring a tenth of your income to the tabernacle. And you're required to do that. If you're a farmer, then you're required to do that when you have a harvest. You bring a tenth of your harvest. If you're a blacksmith, you're required to do that when you get paid. H however income comes to you, these guys don't have money or anything, they're just bartering. And whenever you get something, you're required to bring a tenth to the tabernacle for the Levites. Those, those 12 loaves of bread that get set out every morning, where does the grain come from to make them? Farmers. Farmers harvest their grain and they bring a tenth to the tabernacle and the Levites store it. Remember, the Levites are only a twelfth of the nation, but they're getting a tenth of the produce because they are expected to help the poor. They're getting all these offerings. And notice what God is saying to these people. He's saying to them, you're robbing me. Why? Tithes and offerings. What are tithes and offerings? They're how the Levites eat. They don't get paid. Nobody pays them to do their job. You bring your offerings, you bring your tithe. That's how the Levites eat. And listen to what God says. Chapter 3, verse 10, is one of the weirdest verses in the Bible. Right? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Okay, classics major, right? I, I don't know if this interests any of you or not. We have excavated scores of Greco-Roman temples, scores of them. Do you know what's in their storehouses? You can nod no or yes or no. Usually nothing because what the Greco-Roman gods required of you was gold, silver, bronze. When you came before a god, Apollo, Zeus, Hera, you better bring precious metals. So the reason the storehouses are empty is because that's the first place an invader goes when they invade Greece. Because everybody knows the temples are where all the gold stored. They go to the temples and clean them out. Fortunately, they carved into the walls of their temples all the offerings they got. Thousands and thousands of lines of so-and-so from this city dedicated this much gold to the god, the god Apollo to thank him for his son returning from a sea voyage safely. This guy from this city brought silver and dedicated it to Hera in hopes that his wife's pregnancy, in prayers that his wife's pregnancy would go well. Like we, ha we have that written all across the walls of temples in ancient Greece. The gods of Greece and Rome, they want your gold. They want your stuff. And it goes into their storehouses. And we have come across a couple storehouses that nobody found. And they're full of gold and silver and bronze and things like that. Because that's what the God wants. The God wants your stuff. Okay, I'm Scandinavian. Any other Norwegians, Swedes out there, right? What do our gods want? What do the gods, what does Odin and Thor, what do the gods, the Norse gods want? When you bring a Norse god an offering, what is it? A weapon. A spear. A sword. A 
pike, a lance, a bow. They want weapons because they're gods of war. And those weapons then go into storehouses and places like that, and then that, that's where they go. The Greco-Roman gods, they want your money. The Norse gods, they want your weapons. Gods all across the world, they want your stuff, which is great if you've ever studied archaeology because now there's all this stuff in all these temples, right? How do we know how they made war in Norway in 1000 BC? We found their weapons in their temples. What does this God want? I mean, seriously, think about it. What does this God say, fill my storehouses with? Food. So people can eat. Folks, no other God wants this. No other God comes and says, look, Apollo definitely says you're robbing him. He says it when you don't bring him enough gold. And Odin and Thor do not have kind words for people who turn in trashy weapons to them and expect help. You give them your worst sword and think they're going to help you? No, sorry. This God wants food, so people eat. And he says, you rob me when you don't feed my servants. Like, There's nothing like this out there in ancient history. No other gods are saying things like this. You rob me because you're not bringing food in for my servants. And then the second half of the verse is weirder than the first. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty. Okay, I went through and looked this word up in the whole Old Testament. Like, where does this come from? Like, when do you use this? Okay, testing God, bad. Bad, 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 bad. Don't do it, right? Nothing good comes in the scriptures. Again, I'm just looking at the Hebrew word in the Old Testament. Nothing good comes in the Hebrew scriptures from putting God to the test. He does not like that. He does not appreciate that. Nothing good happens to you when you put God to the test. This is the only place I can find that that uses this word, that God says, test me. Try me out. See what happens. And do you see what he says? He says to them, "Bring, bring the tithe into the storehouse. And he turns around and says, and then I'll fill you, I'll give you so much blessing, your storehouses won't be able to hold it. He says, bring food into my house then I will make sure your food's fine. Your vines won't fall. Your fruit won't fall too soon. Your crops, no pests. Nobody will come and invade you. Like, bring food into my storehouse, and oh, I will fill your storehouses full, and you will have food. There's nowhere else in Scripture where God, at least, again, in the Hebrew Scriptures, where God says, test me. I dare you. Try it out. Just do it once and see if I don't do this for you. Because look at what the people are saying about God. I mean, I don't know about your Bible. My Bible, verse 13, there's a big break in it. But I think this is why, this is what they're saying about God. This is why they don't bring the tithe in. Because what are they saying about serving God? It's futile. Why should we bother serving God? What do we gain by carrying out his requirements? What do I get for this? What's in it for me? If I take a tenth of my income and I take it to the tabernacle and I give it to the tabernacle, then I'm down 10% and they're up 10%. What do I get out of this? There's nothing in this for me. That's what people are saying to God. I think that's why they're not doing it. Like, I don't get anything out of this. Why should I bother being generous? Why should I bother giving this away? Why should I be paying these priests? Like, like they do their job anyway, whether I bring a tenth or not. That's their job. They have to do it. What's in it for me? People were saying. And what's so interesting here is God doesn't answer them. 
Like all from through now until, I mean, we've kind of seen a little bit of it in Malachi, right? God says, hey, return to me. And the people are like, well, how are we supposed to do that? And God says, well, you could stop robbing me for starts. And the people are like, what? We're not robbing you? What are you talking about? There's this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth discussion. There's no back and forth here. God never answers them. Instead, we get this little interlude before we go on to the next question that'll show up in chapter four, verse one, where there are, there are people who still trust God and serve him, and God knows it. And he says in verse 18, someday, one day, you will see a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. You'll see a distinction between those who do serve God and those who don't. It's coming, but it's true you don't see it now. I mean, I don't know, I don't know about you all, right? I, again, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a prophet, but I'm, getting, I'm willing to bet we all have stories where we gave to people, where we were generous, where we helped folks. We took from our time, our money, our resources to help someone, and it, nothing happened, nothing good. We, we have a benevolence committee in our church. I mean, people come to us looking for money. We, 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 uh, this is my 12th year as the pastor here. Wow, we have helped a lot of people in the last 12 years. Do you know how many have come back and said thank you? Take a guess. Zero. We've gotten people jobs. We've gotten them apartments. We've helped. I mean, sometimes it's just paying rent one time. Sometimes it's months of getting on with people. Zero people in 12 years have come back of their own accord and said, thank you. And I know <laughs> when a year later, someone that we've helped, we've, we've, you know, we've, we found this person a new job that makes more money, right? And then they're just, they're gone. You don't hear anything from them. When I see them a year later, they're not there to say thank you. They're there to say, I lost the job. Can you get me another one? It, we all, we all have those stories where we have tried to do what is good and right. We have tried to be generous. We have tried to help and it has failed. And again, I can't speak for you, but there are certainly times for me in ministry when I think this is futile. What, what are we getting out of doing all this? What good is coming from being generous and trying to help people? And I take great comfort in what God says in verse 18. Oh, you will. It's coming. You don't see it now, but you will. There will absolutely come a day when you will see the difference. There will absolutely come a day when this will matter. Sometimes now, oftentimes now, yeah, we don't see it. And so they're not doing it. Again, I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. The other option is, of course, they're just total bozos and don't want to obey. I'm trusting we're not total bozos. We do want to obey. Yeah, lots of times you look at these things, you're like, nothing good is coming of this. Why am I bothering? What do we gain from obeying? What do we gain from helping? What do we gain from trying to do good in these situations when no good seems to come of it? I take great comfort that God says, it will. Yep, you don't see it now, but you will. I, I mean, God listened, God heard, a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Every time you choose to obey him, every time you choose to be generous, every time you choose to give, it, though you don't have to, and no one can force you to, it seems like God's writing all that down. Like he's keeping track of it. It's getting recorded, and the day will come, the Lord says, when all of this is gonna come out. All the good that you've done, all your generosity, all the things you've tried and seemed like they failed miserably. The day is coming when all that will be brought to light. It's all been recorded in the presence of the almighty God. There's a proverb that says, he who gives to the poor lends to God. You're not giving it to God, you're lending it to him because he will absolutely pay you back. He knows it, he's recorded it, he will deal with it. The day will come when you will see it, he says. Now, this, this covenant, this world that we're in, the tabernacle, right? There's no tabernacle anymore. It's gone. 
We don't need it. That's what we celebrated last week. After Jesus, remember one of the things that happened when Jesus died, that 18-inch curtain of fabric that separated God's throne room from everywhere else that nobody could go in? It just rips open. All of a sudden, God's presence is open to people. When Jesus died, we don't need any of this anymore. When God says, bring the tithe, bring the offerings, there is no tithe and there are no offerings anymore. That whole thing is gone. But it's not binding on us anymore. It's not a command. But think about what this tells us about about God. Because remember how he begins, I don't change. But he's still the same God. He doesn't need the tabernacle anymore. He's with us. His spirit can live within us. But think about what this says, that God calls it robbery if we are not supporting his people. Like he takes that very personally. And it's the only time in the Old Testament that God says, test me. Wow, you do not want to test God normally. But he offers it to you here. Test me. This isn't a promise to us. Again, there is no tithe and offering left for us with Jesus. That's gone. There's no no temple. There's no tabernacle. We don't do those things. But God is still God. And think about it. He, He originally took a family. He took all the people who descended from Levi and he put them in ministry, meaning he took them out of the economy and somehow or other they had to get paid. And so he set up a system. He doesn't do that by family anymore. It's not, hey, your name's Smith? Great. You're now a pastor. Your name's Jones? Great. You're a musician. He doesn't do it by family anymore, but he still is constantly taking people and putting them in ministry. We've got a whole wall full of it up there outside. He is still bringing people, taking them out of the economy. People who used to be, you know, butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, they were producing things, they had income. He takes them out and he puts them into ministry. I hope you noticed, you didn't pay to come this morning. There's no box at at the front door. There's no entrance fee. You didn't have to buy a ticket. This is the house of God. It's open to everyone all the time. Everyone is welcome here. Folks, we don't even pass the plate. We don't ever want anyone to walk in here and think, oh, it's pay to pray. I put in the 20, they pray for me, it all works. No, no, this is the house of the living God. You are always welcome here. You need prayer, we'll pray. You need help, we'll help. You want advice, yes, this is the house of the living God. It never costs you anything to come in here, just like it never costs you anything to bring your sacrifice to the Levites. That was their job was to do it. God is still pulling people out of making money and being in the economy and plopping them into ministry and saying, you, you go work with disadvantaged youth downtown. You, you go out into Southeast Asia. You go plant churches here in Bosnia. He's still doing that and it all still has to get paid for. And he's still doing the exact same principles he used to use. He takes some people out of the economy and they do ministry full time. And all the rest of us who produce things, who are in the economy, who get paid, we take a portion. And it's interesting what Paul said to the Corinthians. Not a tenth. Not set aside a tenth. The tithe is gone. That whole system, it's done with. We don't need it anymore. He says, set aside something in keeping with your income. So you've just done your taxes. Now's the time to figure this out. Now's the time to do the things that this God, this God who is concerned about food, he's concerned about people being able to minister. This God who takes it personally, that that we support what he is doing around the world. Wow, now you know what your income is. Now you know what came in. Now you know what came out. Now you know how strongly he feels about it. Again, not under this system. There's no tithes and there's no offerings, right? You don't owe me a dime. We don't pass the plate. You are not required to give a dime to this church and you are welcome to sit here every week. But God has something. He has some place he wants you to plug in. He has something he wants you to give to. He expects your generosity. He doesn't take kindly to people who aren't helping. But where you help, that is between you and him. Because there are no more tithes. And there's no more offerings. 
but they're still the same God and the same principles. Where does God want you being generous? That You have to ask him that. I mean, I'm gonna ask him that and pray for you, but you've gotta ask him, you just did your taxes. You know, you know how much came in, you know what came out. Right? Now is the time to sit down with him and say, Lord, how do, you want, how do you want me to be generous? Where do you want me to be giving? What do you want me to be supporting in the collection for God's people? I mean, that's the whole world. God's people are everywhere and God is at work everywhere. Where do you want me to be involved? Where do you want me to be generous? So that's what I'm gonna pray over us. I'm gonna pray that you know the answer to that question, that you know where the Lord wants you to be generous, that you know where he wants you to be investing. In this case, you know, for these guys, it was sheep and goats and grain. For most of us, it's probably money, but you've, you've heard things like, you know, time, talent, treasure. That, I'm gonna pray that you know where God wants you to invest, but you gotta ask him yourself. It's like taxes, right? It's work. It's a lot of work to get all that done. Oh, but now you know. It doesn't just have to be so you can fulfill your obligation to the government. Your taxes can also be so that you are a generous person before the Lord, so that you say to God, look, look, Lord, look, look how you blessed me. Look at what you gave to me. What do you want me to do with it? That is a joyous, joyous thing to say back to God, you have blessed me. What do you want me to do with it? So let's pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm confident that everyone listening to me, that this past year, we had more than food, clothing, and shelter. That, that, that we had much, much more than just food, clothing, and shelter. I, I know I have so much. I have such an abundance because you are so gracious and you are so kind. And scripture says you love to give gifts to your children. Wow, you have blessed so many of us. Jesus, how do you want us to be like you? You who were poor, you who were rich and became poor for us. How do you want us to take what you have given us and be generous with others? and see you at work, the, the collection for God's people. Who are God's people that you want us to be collecting for? How much do you want us to set aside? Where do you want us to give it? Lord, we are your servants, and so it is for you to direct us. It is for you to tell us what you want us to give, where you want us to give it, how much you want us to do, because everything we have is yours. You've only promised us food, clothing, and shelter, and yet you have given us so much more. Jesus, how do you want us to turn around and be generous just like you, to be the people of a God who gives and gives and gives? Lord, speak to us. We, 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 need, we need your spirit to instruct us. As we've, we've done our taxes, we, we know. We know how much came in. We know how much came out, came out, went out. We know how you have blessed us, and we know how we've been generous. Lord, what would you have us do? Because we so, so desire to be like you. You, Jesus, whom we celebrated last week. You who died for us when we were your enemies. Now that we are not your enemies, now that we are your children, how do you want us to look like you? We pray this in your name, Lord, because we are yours. Amen. Now, we'll close this time as we always do. We'll, we'll take communion, which is a remembrance. That's what Jesus said to do. Do this and remember. We remember that Jesus isn't asking us to do anything he hasn't already done. That's what scripture says. Jesus was far richer than any of us ever will be, and really he became far poorer than any of us probably ever will be. He gave up his life in heaven. He gave up his prerogatives. He gave up his power to become a human like us, and then to die in our place. He's not asking us to do that. So we remember that, that he has done these things before us. So as always, there are four stations in each of the corners. There's one down here to my right, which has gluten-free on it if you need that. I'm gonna pray over us, and then as when I finish praying, go on up to any of the stations, get a piece of the bread, get the cup, and take it back to your seats, and I'll lead us as we take it together. So pray with me again. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, that is what we always say here. We will never get tired of saying that. Thank you.
I mean, you come to us and you ask us to be generous, but you ask it because you have already been generous. You, you don't ask it to us and say, you know, that, that maybe you will save us if we will give away enough money. You save us, just flat out. You, you trade your life for ours. You defeat death so that it can't defeat us. And then you call us to remember and respond. So Jesus, we do exactly what you said. We, we take this bread, we take the cup so that we remember. We remember what you have done for us. Remind us, Lord, you know we will so quickly forget. Remind us this week what you have done for us. We pray this in your name, Jesus, always in your name. Amen. In that same letter to the Corinthians that I read from at the very beginning about collecting money for the work of God's people, earlier, just a few chapters in chapter 11, Paul talks about this, what we're doing here. And he says, what I received from the Lord is what I will pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember me. So let's remember the generosity of our Lord and take the bread. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember me. Let's remember the generosity of our Lord. For whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. If you'll put that cup in the little holder right in front of you, and while you're doing that, pray with me one more time. Thank you, Lord. We, we remember. I mean, I know I'll forget. I'll, I'll, I'll forget this afternoon. But thank you. We remember. We remember that you did this first. We remember the truth of what John will say in his letter, that we didn't love you, and then you responded to us. You loved us, and you saved us. And so we respond to you. Thank you. We are so grateful, Lord. We know you did not have to do this. No one made you. As you told Pilate, no one could take your life from you. You could call tens of thousands of angels to fight for you. But you didn't. You didn't call a single one. Thank you. We are so so grateful. Lord, we want to be generous because you have been generous with us. But you know it is hard. You know it is hard for us to trust. It is hard for us to believe. It is hard for us to trust that, that if we give something away, that you will do just what you told the people in Malachi. You will provide for them. You will give it back to them in spades. You know it is hard for us to remember that. It is hard for us to believe that. Holy Spirit, remind us. Bring it, bring it back up. Don't let us forget. Remind us over and over that you can be trusted and therefore we can be generous. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Always. We pray everything in your name. You are our God. Amen. Now stand with me and let's sing again.
truth. You paid everything on the cross for us. We love you for it and we're thankful. We respond in gratefulness and as we go through this week, pray that you would fix our eyes on you and what you would have us do for others. I pray all this in your name. Amen. DCC, you are sent. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. And elders at this time, if you want to come up and be available for prayer. Thank you.